I don't think that we usually think about the relative scale of the numbers that we use. We're all familiar with like a thousand and a million. To put it in context, a thousand seconds is like 16 minutes and a million seconds is 11 days. That's not so bad, but what about a billion? More and more in daily life, we hear about billions of dollars and billionaires and things like that. A billion seconds is 31 years. Just trying to give you an idea because numbers, statistics, probabilities, it's not magic. It's never magic. It's that. and welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections from the previous Because Science episode, and I smash that response button. Like the Hulk would do. Ah! Respond. Ah! You are actually incorrect, sir. And we're talking about the Hulk because on the last episode of Because Science, we were asking a very serious and critical question. Uh, th these are my favorite questions to ask. I call them second tier questions. Uh, taking something that we know about pop culture and applying just another level of thought to it to get to an interesting conclusion. Like, can Wolverine get a tattoo? Maybe my favorite all time question. But this one was, can the Hulk, with all of his incredible feats of strength and, and power, can he jump into space? Give me a little bit of a, a cosmic twist there. Whoa! I said that given the Hulk's amazing capabilities that we've seen in decades of comics, he punched time once, which was crazy. I said that he could absolutely jump into space. But what did you have to say? That was a breathy one. Like how Freddie Mercury sang, it was very breathy. Somebody. So our first comment comes from Zenion, and a uh, previous super nerd Warland writer who say, if the Hulk is tumbling through space, I said that he would be set adrift. He wouldn't be able to change his direction, and he would just be floating out in space as a angry green meat popsicle forever. But what Zenion and Warland writer are pointing out is that the Hulk is the kind of person who would take his pants off and throw them in a direction opposite that he wanted to go. We actually mentioned that as a way to double jump in our double jumping episode, but that's all that rocket science really is. It's figuring out ways to throw some amount of stuff quickly in the direction opposite that you want to go. Because if you just remove some mass from you and you throw it away from you really quick, because of the conservation of momentum, you throw some mass boop, away from you and you will travel in the other direction. If the Hulk, I don't have a purple marker. If the Hulk took off his pants in space and then threw them as hard as he could in the other direction, he would travel in that other direction and he would be able to change his direction somewhat. Warland Ryder says he's the kind of hero who would rip off his own arm and throw it in the opposite direction, which would get him somewhere faster. Our next comment comes from Mr. Ro Rock It. Man, who says, hey Kyle, when you were calculating the escape velocity of the Hulk, does that assume that there are no other gravity wells around? If the Hulk was traveling at escape velocity of Earth, then wouldn't the Hulk fall into the gravity well of the sun and then orbit the sun? Yes. I was assuming that there were no other significant sources of gravity around to pull him into orbit, but using the velocity that we calculated using an incredible amount of energy that takes some hand waving to make sense, an earthquake eight, nope, a magnitude eight earthquakes worth of energy, then the Hulk would be leaving Earth, if everything else we're assuming is correct, at a thousand times escape velocity. And then not only would he have escape velocity of Earth, he'd have escape velocity for the sun, the solar system, and the Milky Way. He's going, going, gone. Baseball? I don't know. I don't watch the bald sports. I'm biased against spherical sports. That's why I love hockey and pole vaulting. Our next comment is a smart one. It comes from Nick Kellerhaus, Hals, who says, if we're throwing a baseball at relativistic velocities in an atmosphere, I said that even if you could throw a baseball at escape velocity, it wouldn't escape the Earth's atmosphere because the atmosphere would act to destroy it. Nick says, aren't drag forces irrelevant in that example? The end result you describe is accurate, but it wouldn't be, be because of drag. The baseball would expose, 
The baseball would explode because of ongoing cascading fusion reactions on the face of the ball as the atoms in the ball fuse with the atoms in the air. The relative velocity of the ball being so massive that the air molecules are essentially frozen in place and aerodynamics don't really apply. That's an incredibly awesome analysis and I think you're absolutely right, but I think we are dealing with a little bit of semantics here. So yes, the ball would destroy itself and so drag is not really like traditional atmospheric drag like it's on an airplane that we consider. But I've also seen physicists in papers talk about the drag that you would experience if you're going at near light speed through empty space. There'd be a drag on you from particles just in empty space. There's enough that there would be some drag on you and that drag would irradiate you to death in less than a second. So I think there's different uses for the term drag and that we're all correct. This isn't a correction, it's a comment, so never mind. Good comment. Our next comment comes from Nate Von Hagen, who says, I have a question. You know that the Hulk is super strong and how he appears to grow in size when transforming? Yeah, I do. What if he is just spontaneously blocking his pores with oil and becomes covered in so many pimples that he grows on size, providing more strength form his new body mass. I know it's probably wrong, but it's just a theory, a film theory. Thanks for reading. No, to all of it. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Comatose, who's still alive and kicking. It's like a play on comatose and his toes, cause he's, who says, yeah, comic book companies do not normally have physics advisors on staff and continuity is not a universal concern. Okay, assuming that the initial velocity at rest is zero and the final velocity of the Hulk is escape velocity, 11 kilometers per second, and the extension of the Hulk's leg is about one meter for simplicity, then the acceleration is 62 million meters per second per second. It's nowhere near Planck acceleration, but I doubt that it is possible for any physical object to pull these kinds of Gs. It's beyond me, but I wonder what is the largest acceleration recorded at the Large Hadron Collider for comparison. Now, I love this comment for two reasons. A, or one, because I did the exact same analysis for the Hulk's acceleration when I was researching this episode and used one meter and got similar stuff, so nice. Two, or B, there actually is something that can pull that many Gs. So if you divide 62 million meters per second per second by the acceleration due to Earth's gravity, 9.81 meters per second per second, you can get the relative unit Gs. And if you do that, it's six million Gs, which is admittedly an incredible amount. But do you remember what we mentioned on this very show not too long ago? The nematocyst of the jellyfish the nematocyst of the jellyfish. It's the cell that contains the stinging hypodermic needle bars that shoot out of the jellyfish and sting into you. And they can only do that being so small by pulling an extreme amount of G and putting an extreme amount of pressure on your skin. And they've been clocked at pulling five million G. I know it's not six million G, but it's so close. So yes, if you change the scale a little bit, there is a physical object in the universe that can pull as many G's as the Hulk would. How cool is that? Congratulations, whatever your name was. Comatose, you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> but of course, I'm not always right. So what did I get wrong in the last episode? Man, so much, so much, so much hair on my face. Do you know what makes thinking about this disgustingness even worse? Think of your body like a Play-Doh machine and think of your pores like the holes in the Play-Doh and your body just play doing out protein out of your face. Like you're like squeezing it, it's like like that. Yeah. Oh. Our first correction is the biggest correction and it's not really a correction of our conclusions but it comes from a lot of people who all say if the Hulk had to rip Wolverine in half, he wouldn't have to rip adamantium apart because Wolverine's skeleton is not completely encased in adamantium. For example, in between his vertebra and his spine, there's still just tissue. So everyone is pointing out that the Hulk only has to rip through human tissue, which would necessarily require less force. Well, yeah, if the Hulk was ripping through human fleshy flesh and not indestructible metal, 
it would obviously take less force. But I'm not completely sure that Wolverine isn't completely encased in adamantium. Look at this awesome comic cover from Civil War 48, I think it is, where Wolverine has his entire body blown off by an explosion, and all that is left is an awesome looking skeleton. That is one of my favorite images in all of comics. Now, how could Wolverine be standing up if all of the material in between his vertebra was burned off, like all of the other flesh on his body. You would assume in that kind of explosion, with that kind of heat, it would vaporize all of his tissues. And if the tissue that you said I should be ripping apart was vaporized, how would Wolverine be standing and not just and fall off? The explanation probably is because it looks awesome. But my explanation is, is that you are wrong. It's a lot, even ripping a human even ripping a human spine apart is going to take a lot. But you actually all gave me an idea for an episode, which I'm going to do. Would you actually want an adamantium skeleton? So thank you. And you're right. And I'm right. Win win! Our next correction is the other big one. Uh, Anthony Davidson, Robert Capron, and Falcon Safey all say something similar. With the Hulk putting that much force on the ground beneath his feet, wouldn't the ground basically just be destroyed and move out from underneath his feet faster than the Hulk can jump upwards? So it would be like trying to jump on the surface of water. So the Hulk wouldn't actually jump at all. His legs would just punk into the ground. Technical term. A punk. Based on my estimations and some of the other nerds that I talked to who helped me with this episode, I was assuming that the material is not responding fast enough. The Hulk's feet are moving so rapidly, they're pulling six million G, that the material itself does not have enough time to respond to that action, and so it acts as a solid. Also, if the Hulk is applying enough force to compress that material down so that it's so dense, like star level dense, then that density would act as some kind of stoppage to the fleshy density of the Hulk. The same reason why with fleshy density you can't really punch through a concrete wall without destroying your hand. So, I think there is some circumstance, some scenario where the Hulk can press off off of the ground. And even if he's not getting the full velocity, even if he's only getting 1% of what we calculated, he'd still have escape velocity and go up into the sky. But then the atmosphere would come more into play. If the escape velocity we calculated wasn't so grand, and if it was closer to 11, you know, maybe we calculated 50, then I think it'd be more of a problem. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I got to give to Dunkle Ostis. Wait, no, that's a cool animal. I know it is. It's a cool animal with a stupid name. Dunkle Ostis. I know, it's like that fish with like the bone face. Yeah. It's a cool fish with the bone face. Check it out. Oh, my Google says that I have looked it up before. I just love bone faces. What Dunkel Ostia says and what uh, Cody's Lab also points out, the YouTube channel Cody's Lab, hey, thanks for leaving a comment, dude. I watch your videos a lot and I think they're great, so thanks. But because you have millions of subscribers, I'm gonna give the super nerd to this other guy. Just a second. So Dunkel Ostias says, Steel is a lot denser than the Hulk, and if the steel cap in Operation Plumb Bob were turned sideways, it would have much less drag. The Hulk doesn't have that lux luxury. When you're talking about 11,000 kilometers per second, you have to treat air resistance differently. The speed of sound is only 0.343 kilometers per second, which means that the air doesn't have enough time to move out of the way of the Hulk. Instead, the air hits him and has to be accelerated with him. If we take the Hulk surface area to be about one square meter, and we know the standard atmospheric pressure, we can do some math to determine there is roughly 10,000 kilograms of air above him. Additionally, as you said, he would be imparting an equal and opposite force down on the ground when he jumped. If there are nuclear explosions happening as he hits the air, that would generate force against him. I'm not a physicist, so I can't do complicated math with integration that you need to calculate all the factors, but I'm pretty sure you couldn't leave the atmosphere with something a density of one and no form of continuous propulsion. I'm giving you the super nerd correction because that sounds like a script that I would write. 
And in researching this episode uh, with some others like at Tough SF, we came up with the same thing, that the Hulk would have to move thousands of kilograms of air out of the way as he traveled towards space and accelerate all that air, thousands of kilograms, up to his same ridiculous speed. It's not a velocity. Escape velocity is not actually a velocity. It's a speed. It doesn't matter which way you're pointed because velocity is a vector, so it has a direction. Speed does not have a direction. It's actually escape speed, which sounds like a cool Nicolas Cage film. But anyway, as the Hulk goes through the air, as I was estimating, he is hitting air molecules so hard that he is causing them to fuse. But I think that he still has enough velocity to accelerate uh, 10,000 or so kilograms of air up to his velocity, or at least he has enough initial energy to still achieve escape velocity. That was my estimation, but I think where you are going with this, if you make some different assumptions, is exactly right. That's why most objects wouldn't be able to escape the atmosphere, uh, given their size, if they're the size of the Hulk, and if they had a density of one. Anyway, I think you're right. I have differing estimations on what would happen, but... You are indeed a super nerd. Ah! Bonefish, skull face. It had bones in its eyes too, like good bones. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is gonna be because you already saw it two days earlier than everyone else because you saw Because Science and other premium content from Nerdist and Geek and Sundry all up on Alpha. That's great, thank you. <laughs> but if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, you should. The next episode of Because Science is, should you wear weighted clothing all of the time like Goku? Should you? That's right, in this week's episode, I'm looking into exercise science to see if there is a real benefit to wearing weighted clothing, like weight vests and wrist weights and ankle weights. I got it that time. Is there a real way for all of that to increase your power level. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, and leave me all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and weird comments about my hair at facebook.com slash because science, youtube.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. I'm checking all of those places for all of this show. Just this one. Hey, and don't forget. I forgot. Hey, and don't forget, risk is relative. It depends on what you do. One of the most cited risk statistics maybe ever, right, is that you are more likely to die from uh, a coconut falling on your head or uh, a vending machine falling on you than you are to die from a shark bite. And that is in general true, but why? Why are you more likely to be killed by a falling coconut? I think people assume that if you're just walking around, a coconut might fall on your head. But what do people do to both coconut trees and vending machines? They shake them, right? So that increases the relative risk of dying from those things because you'll shake a coconut onto your head or the weight of all of that food you shouldn't be eating will kill you as it crushes you. I still don't know what point I'm trying to make. I guess what I'm trying to say is that statistics are always interesting and fascinating, like the coconut thing, to me, but it depends on context. Context is key, especially if you do not want to be killed by a coconut. <laughs>